actually there were five people on the lineup which they were all in solid color tops excepting for the defendant he actually was in a light color top and still the witness could not point him out but 15 months after during trial his memory became very much like sharp he told one of the court reporters that he wanted to talk to the district attorney that the guy who is on sitting in the courtroom he's sure that that's the guy that he saw the day of the crime the problem with cases like this is usually money well say i'm going to need an expert who can reconstruct this scene you got to pay say i'm going to need an expert who will tell me uh, about the tracks on the shoe a shoe expert a shoe print expert you got to pay money say i'm going to need uh, someone to do a DNA on, run a DNA on these uh, material, these evidence. Again, you're going to need money from the DNA expert. Okay? You see, that is one of the big problems that poor and minority defendants face. They don't have the money to try their case properly, and the government doesn't provide them that support. Hi, assalamu alaikum, dear um. Pain is something I do with a smile. If I can't smile, I grin. And if I can't grin, I put the painting away until I can. With this painting, I smile all the way. I pray you have a happy birthday with love, your son, Anwar. That one was from Sing Sing. When a person is accused and sentenced, something like that, especially if they're young, it impacts not only the family, it impacts friends, it impacts community. In other words, I'm serving time with him. These cases of wrongful imprisonment, it's hard and sometimes tired some, but um, I would say for my friend Colin Case, I learned that once you believe in something and you believe that it's right and you pursue it persistent, you can make great changes. And any little change that you can make, it counts. Thanks for going in with us on criminal justice. And while justice may be blind, our eyes are open and our cameras are always rolling. To catch past episodes of Going In or anything else we do at Brick TV, find us on the web at youtube.com slash Brick TV. Bye now. Emotional, in-depth, and unfiltered stories that explore the complexity of how we live. It's news worth knowing in the time it takes to tell it. So find us for new perspectives on the place you call home. I didn't understand what it was to be a Muslim without struggle, without someone who was the antithesis to me. Autobiography is not to be trusted unless it can reveal something disgraceful. When it happens to you, you realize what, nobody's immune from some of this stuff. See, all of this rain represents my sorrow. I had a tough day. I want a better tomorrow. 
God forbid something happens like this again, we need to be ready. Dream. 
lips grow Just dream Just dream Just dream As a teenager and I would sleep with my guitar in my bed and I had a lofted bed at college and I had one of those dreams where you're dancing and it was a ballroom dancing experience and I threw a leg out and I kicked my guitar out of the loft and it, you know woke me up by hitting the floor um, and then it had a giant crack in it. So I researched it and I fixed it and it worked. That was the first time I fixed a guitar. <laughs> I'm Chloe Smotner. And I'm Mamie Minch. And we co-own Brooklyn Luthery. It's been really empowering to own our own business. And we can kind of write the book. We can do things the way we want. Um, yeah, I found it really pleasurable and fun and cool to do it with my friend Chloe. Um, we decide how we want to have our days be, how we want the space to be. Um, you know, part of starting the shop was not only that we wanted to have our own shop, but it was that it felt like the community really had space for it. Um, in a way, I kind of think that the musical community had been failed by all the shops locally being run by you know, guys. I think uh, on a whole, <clears throat> it's felt like starting a small business, we felt like we've had a lot of support, you know, yes. whether it be from, you know, our immediate friends and community, you know, or our clientele or the other shops that exist. Um, yeah, it hasn't felt like too much of a struggle. Good. Right. It's the difference between doing something by yourself in a basement and being part of a community. You know, people come in here, they know us, we know them, um, we've developed these relationships over the years. We've been open for four years, and before that we worked in other shops around town. So um, it feels really good to be part of people's circle in that way. I really like the analogy of, of like a doctor's office, or, or some, maybe even an ER. There's a whole, yeah, triage uh, that happens. Um, and it is often like dealing with a person's loved one, <laughs> you know? People are very attached and if something comes in with a big injury, um, they're kind of freaking out. Um, and I think it's kind of part of both of our sort of ethos, which is fixing. You know, we facilitate things you know, things working again when they stop working and something feels wrong, come see us, we make it better. Like, that's cool. That's, I think there's an amount of grit in that that we um, both identify with. I think of craftsmanship and the kind of craftsmanship that we would like to do here as being something that you develop. You know, if you do our job well, I've heard someone say, it's, it's impossible to tell that anyone has touched the guitar. Just sort of a downer in a way, right? <laughs> if you do a good job, it's totally invisible. It looks like the break never happened, but it's really satisfying. And when I think of craftsmanship, I also think of like the history and tradition of a particular trade, almost like a society of people kind of information sharing and you know there's a whole history of technique and development so yeah I think of that. I've really enjoyed meeting working musicians working across the board different kinds of music and different 
capacities. Um, but I've been surprised how like re rewarding it's been to work with um, amateur musicians. Somebody who's learning, somebody who's a kid, people who pick it up after years of having put it down. Um, I really like that. People get a lot of pleasure out of it. It's a way that um, kind of anybody could have access to art or something creative or something you know that maybe feels a little bit bigger than day to day life. Brooklyn's music scene, yeah, I feel like it's, you know, bubbling away. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on and uh, particularly, I mean, f from what I've seen uh, in kind of the roots music scene right. um, and folk music, yeah, which has always been there in New York, but Brooklyn, yeah, there's a, a few just kind of like roots and, and world music stronghold venues like Barbez and yeah. Jalopy Theater uh, and Sunny's that just, you know, have jams and open mics and just kind of community hub. Um, yeah, I think the music scene is really accessible and it's really varied. She said it. <laughs> I don't know if I need to say anything else. It's actually a like kind of high pressure situation, you guys. Looking at us and expecting us to be brilliant. <laughs>
and humanoid in scale. They do reflect on aspects of living organisms. So you can, you, you can feel, when they perform, you can feel that they're alive. The border crosser is this artwork that is, is meant to sort of uh, propose this ephemeral gesture of peace and unity. This wheeled uh, blob of fabric appears in the desert setting in the rugged terrain of the border, it begins to deploy. And the idea is that the, the border crosser uh, grows into a, a monumental height arc and deploys a secondary arc over the border fence and touches the other side. So my work, most importantly, has looked at more uh, from, from the singular being human part to looking at how humans are being treated. You know, so it's, it's, it's grown outward. Instead of unity or pushing towards unity, what's tending to happen is there's a push to, uh, to separation. And I've been more interested in looking at the worldwide issues that I can address with my work. Yes, the machine can do, can pick the fruit. Yes, the machine can build you the car. Yes, the machine can weld better than you. Yes, the machine can play chess better than you. Yes, 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 et cetera, et cetera. We're playing out science fiction. But can the machine recover the earth that the machine is destroying for us? There will be more and more robots for the better and the worse. But if we can make a contribution to to creating a different expectations of what robots could be. An artistic robot to study our own humanity, make us think differently about what we are, what defines us as a human, but also what else we can create. When you make art, we cannot do it to please others. We have to do it to make them think. And some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it. But at least you're making them think. And that's really what I want. My name is Grimanesa Moros. I'm a multimedia artist. I was born in Peru, and now I live and work here in New York City. Growing up in Peru is quite interesting from uh, many different areas. It's because we have what is the coast, the serra, and the jungle. In my case, I grew up by the ocean. So I think that water has been a very great influence. This brought a lot of bubbles that they accumulate all around you know, the shore. So I think that since I was very little, I got very interested in the play of light and water. I discovered light on a trip that I went to Iceland and uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I can't recall exactly, maybe it was 2000, and I couldn't sleep. And so I woke up and I encountered this unbelievable sky. And I truly didn't know what it was, but I couldn't stop saying, wow. And then obviously later I realized that it was in the Robo Realis. And so since then I said to myself, Wow, if I could only share this with others, this moment, what I felt, wouldn't be amazing. Uh, the project and the fee, for example, in the case of Hedera, has been thought about the community. You know, the park itself and the architecture, how the, the piece was gonna be responding to the, to the environment and with the people. And what I want is to activate you know, the community, when they go, they're going to have different, you know, thoughts, concepts, they're going to experience the work differently. And that somehow activates them and inspires them to be more creative. And many wonderful things will come out from it. To build a piece like that, it requires a lot of collaborative team effort. Building the piece there, being on the field for three weeks, that's an amazing magical experience as well to see how from nothing gets built. How many you know, tubings I'm gonna be using, how many domes, because that requires about the amount of LED lines and electrical hardware, power supplies, and all the goodies that it goes with it. I truly have to know what I want because each lines are 240 feet, some of them more, and so it requires a lot of manpower to hold them 
you know, some of them are thick, they are heavy. So I cannot improvise that much because to put each tube takes maybe three hours, sometimes more, depends, right? So imagine if I have to, okay, I'm sorry, I don't like it now, it goes down. So it is, it is pressure for me to perform. You require confidence to truly know what you want. And I think in my case, I have got it through time. Hedera is a 360 all around. So you constantly have to build the piece, having that in consideration, that it has to make sense you know, to me from all these different angles. Well, you know, obviously, my intention is truly to grab my viewer. So if I'm able to take you into the piece for seconds, then I think that I being, have been successful. Basically, within my installations, I'm thinking about what they're going to feel like. And, and I think in abstract work, one thing that people don't realize is it's all about what's happening inside of you as a responder and as a viewer. My name is Kennedy Yanko, and I'm a sculptor and painter. I feel as an artist, like my, my biggest struggles that come up are just always getting over the hump to the next step. You know, like it's kind of like creating a new project. There's a cyclical nature to like what you're doing. There's the beginning where you're like conceiving it and thinking about it, and there's a lot of blocks there. And then there's the building of it, not knowing like what's going to happen next, and there's the blocks there. And then there's this kind of the climactic moment of when it's installed and it's ready to go and you get to share it. And I think, you know, that frustrating part in between of not really knowing what's going on is, is definitely challenging for me. Step one for a feel for is, was really about what I cared about and what I wanted to think about and what I wanted people to hear about. And that somehow manifested its way into materials. So when I when I was first figuring it out, I had no idea what it was going to look like. I had a couple of different like sketch-ups. The brick auditorium has these beautiful stairs that were kind of reminiscent of the Mexican aqueducts. And I was thinking of like creating something about being a source of providing, something that would provide to a community and provide to people. Moss was something that had kind of made its way into my studio. So I'll get a material in my studio or I'll be thinking about something and it will sit there for months. But it became a really pr perfect opportunity for Moss. So the tin ceiling comes from the tenement buildings in the Lower East Side. And they were kind of considered something that would elevate a space or make you know, a home more elite. The tin ceiling is representative of, of, of a white picket fence or this idea of like how one should present themselves in life. The moss and the water bring this idea of, like, of the life force of this place, this internal place of, of how you're navigating through things. And it's actually overgrowing onto the, to the tin. And I think that anytime there's like an overwhelming amount of deprivation, it's gonna come out in a really ugly way. So the, the moss is kind of just working its way through that because it, it's gonna come out sooner or later, you know? And it might not be so pretty. The structure is about like eliminating the structure. Instead of creating our world and our lives around the institution, Let's create the institution around ourselves and like what we need. It's about responding to us. I certainly feel that there's a signature that weaves its way through all my pieces. Um, even if there's not a skin on it or if there's not a particular shape that it takes on, I think, I think every artist has their own flavor. You know, if you take two artists that are doing something really similar, they're still going to taste completely different.
Growing up, I was always really into drawing, making collages, drawing people on the subway. As I got older, I really wanted to be an artist, but I couldn't figure out really how I'd make a living doing it. I started working in finance. I moved to New York and, you know, I thought maybe I'll try to make a, a bunch of money in the beginning and then retire early and be an artist after that. And then I started to see more and more new media art. So people using technology to make sculptures, to make interactive artwork. It really seemed like it had a place in the future. It spurred me to quit what I was doing and start making art. My name is Jason Krugman and I'm a light sculptor. I call myself a light sculptor because I primarily work with LEDs and it's almost like weaving with electricity and then I sculpt with it. This sculpture is called Basket. There are about 3,000 LEDs and is using much, much less than a single 40 watt incandescent bulb. That got me into thinking about the way that electronics relate to the natural world it's inspired by these tiny little microscopic creatures called diatoms, and also radiolarians. They're incredible because they have these beautiful symmetries. The way that I first learned about them was by looking at drawings by Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel was amazing because he documented many, many different types of species, kind of on par with Darwin in terms of his, his contribution to documenting life. What's really amazing about them is you can see how efficient their bodies are. Seeing a living creature that it almost looks like a calculus equation really ties in the idea of structuring things so that they're efficient and in that efficiency, finding beauty. Right now I'm sitting in my studio, which is housed at New Lab in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. New Lab is a platform for scaling frontier technologies and champions the world's most forward-thinking entrepreneurs. We recently expanded into a new fabrication workshop here, where we will build huge sculptures that weigh thousands of pounds. So this is the new fab space. We're building 20 light sculptures here in about two months. And we're going to start cutting, gluing things. We were lucky enough to find a great warehouse space across the street at the Cumberland Packing Corp where they used to pack all of the sweet and low and sugar in the raw packets that people like to put in their coffee. It was a great space, a little weird because sometimes when someone would sweep the floor or move something, you could get a very faint taste of a sweet and low. It was pretty gross. <laughs> We built tables, we set up saws, we set up basically a whole wood shop, and so we were able to get a ton done in a very short amount of time. When we're fabricating these sculptures, we try to design the process and the tools to be as efficient as possible. One person can go and make a thousand cuts in one day. We have a good team of people working on a variety of machinery. So cutting and spot welding thousands and thousands of stainless steel tubes without having noticeable weld marks on the outside that needed to be cleaned up. Cleaning welds takes a lot of time. A lot of my artwork is about making things that are very delicate where the entire uh, structure is revealed. And so when I'm making artworks for outdoors or for much larger spaces, I have to think about how am I going to continue with the same type of aesthetic vocabulary and form, but working with materials that allow it to hold up to the environment. I'm currently in the midst of a big project making permanent outdoor light sculptures for a sculpture park in Jeju Island, South Korea. It's a new sculpture park that's being converted from a green tea farm. It's about 50 acres. There'll be a path that people walk along and they'll encounter different artworks. The idea that's really important to take people kind of on a gradual roller coaster so that they're not overstimulated and that their mind uh, and their eyes and, and their emotions have enough time to reset.
One of the sculptures that I'm most excited to see, it's a light sculpture, but it's entirely based on reflected light, which I think is a really elegant way of making light artwork that lasts really well outdoors. It's my first time acting as a curator, but also as a producer and an artist. The two artists that I invited with me are Tom Fruin and Jen Lewin. Jen Lewin is a Brooklyn-based artist. She is well known for making a series of works called The Pool, in which there are dozens of circular platforms outdoors. People are invited to play and dance to create an interactive playground that's both an artwork and an activity. The other artist who I brought in is, is named Tom Fruin, and he has some really beautiful big light sculptures that he makes in the form of stained glass water towers and greenhouses that I think are some of the nicest pieces of public art that I've ever seen. At night, it's going to be absolutely stunning. The whole thing is about creating these amazing, interesting spaces that people are going to really want to fly to Jeju to see. You're looking down over this rolling hills with green tea and you see the ocean in the distance. So at night, when there are light sculptures scattered throughout the landscape, it's going to feel really magical. This is all I know, but it's in my heart. I've been here all my life. Without this kind of barrier in the middle. This is in my blood, man. You know, my thing is more about the image. It brings joy to my life. Applying them to the world seems really important too. I love the neighborhood. A type of storytelling you don't really hear about. Taking some of those creative ideas and getting together with a community, which is the central core of our work. Uh, biggie small? White? Oh, okay. Do you see? Uh, making a show. What I was fantasizing about. Tell us whatever you want will be given. Yep. I was at my grandmother's house one day and um, some strange people came. I remember saying, like, Grandma, where are we going I, I, while I'm leaving? Next thing I know, I went to this cramped up, scary looking building. I remember being whipped with whips, being sexually molested. It was torture. My name is Sharon Martinez. 
I am a former child of the system. I noticed there was a lot of kids in foster care and I felt like I wanted to give back. I felt I had so much love in my heart to, to share besides with my own children. He's God himself. I decided at the age of 32 to become a foster parent. I have had all teenage boys. All of them were special needs. A lot of them came with gang mentalities, drug use, I'm skipping curfew. When they come through my door, I tell them I don't do central booking. Please do not get arrested. The court or ACS, they expect so much of a male once they age out of foster care. So I chose to deal with young men because females could get a little bit more help than the male children can. I got put into foster care because of child neglect. I was in the ACS building for two weeks with my brother Jalil. They sent me to a residential treatment center. It was a little boy, like a 10-year-old boy, it was gonna like getting molested inside the house. I thought they was trying to like do that to me because that's what I was overhearing. So my roommate, like he helped me run away and God's luck, like I just hopped on a random bus. I didn't know where I was going and I just kept going on bus and bus and I was able to sit here. I've been through a lot and my stepdad abusing me. He told me he was going to kill me. I was like, I got to get out of here. So I went to school. I told him I'm not going back home. I would explain to them, well, I know how you feel. And some of them would say to me, no, you don't know how I effing feel. And I would have to just tell them, like, look, I came from your life. That's my life. I have two foster boys, which is brothers. They're 20 and 18. I tell them, I don't play you cutting schools. Education is extremely important to me because I want to see you graduate and succeed from high school slash college because I know you're very intelligent. She helped support me to do my, my dreams, what I want to accomplish in life. I want to be a defense attorney. I got accepted to Ithaca College and uh, I plan on getting my master's degree in history and education so I can become a history teacher. It's not easy, you know, trying to juggle a job and dealing with what I deal with. So I just do child care from time to time, I do hair sometimes, and I get food supplement from the city to help make sure I have. This is like really the first, really the first home that I really ever had. There's, um, there's a lot of foster carers that really don't care about the kids at all. It's just a check and then when they turn 18 to 21, you know, it's out the door. When you age out of foster care at 21, if you don't have a job, you're basically homeless. You're discharged to a shelter. I still feel that a 21-year-old needs a whole bunch of support. It's not easy for them to just be thrown out there because the streets are dangerous and they will swallow you alive. On set, I could stay here when I get 21. I don't want to be here, but I want to be independent. I want to be independent too and have tried to get my own place in the process. Just because you came from a broken home don't mean your home has to be broken. You can break that cycle. You are gonna upgrade your home and then you're gonna be able to help someone that once came from where you came from. So that's my goal. And that's what I do. That's why. No, you said you, you did it. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the room. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Oh shit! They shot him? Oh my fucking goodness. Oh America is a country that is founded on slavery and genocide and it's based on exploitation and oppression. As long as you have that and as long as you have the police actually enforcing relations of exploitation and oppression, people are actually unfortunately going to have to be out fighting in the street for justice. There are more people that are killed by the police than are killed by, by lynching at the height of lynching each year. Last year there were over 1,300 people killed by the police. You were nine times as likely to get killed by the police if you're black than if you're white. <laughs> rallies matter because if people don't fight back in a range of different ways, including at rallies, then they get ground down and can't resist at all. And the other thing that matters is today's empire is tomorrow's ashes. We need revolution. And, you know, they don't come out of nowhere. My hope is that actually people can, you know, build a movement for revolution and get rid of this monster. Street, street, our street. Shut it down! Shut it down! I'm originally from Iran. Shut it down. Shut down. It's a lot easy for Americans, it seems, uh, because of the media and the media coverage, uh, to grieve uh, people that are uh, that are dying under the hands of author quote unquote authoritarian regimes. Uh, but if people are dying under the hands of a quote unquote democratic regime, uh, we almost automatically trust that this is something. Um, okay or it's just or that the police had reasons had good reasons for it uh, but they don't uh, this is these are just innocent people uh, dying for their own existence when I first heard about the shooting with Philandra I, I would wanted to cry I read it on the train this morning and I wanted to cry like I felt like I lost somebody and I don't even know him like that hurts it hurts. It's like no matter what you do, you're just being prejudged off of your skin color. Look at the president. He's a black man and he still gets called a nigger. Black man getting shot should not be like the weather. It should not be happening almost every other week. I just thought about all the other people who got shot, you know. Trayvon Martin, no like Brown, all these other kids and when Trayvon Martin got shot and when that was all happening, I was actually the same age because it's like, so that just made me think, that could be me. And I don't want that to be me. I think it's important as a white person to utilize my privilege to speak up for, for the, the black members of my society, of the society that I share with them. I mean, unity is one thing that we need to come together as a, as a community and, and show what we can do. But honestly, I'm at a loss. This is this is my only resort. I think protesting is about as effective as me voting, and I don't think it's doing much. But I'm still going to do something. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Now. Justice for. Alton Sterling. Justice for. Alton Sterling. Justice for. Alton Sterling. As a mother, I have Jonah holding the sign because we want to reinforce the idea, and we want to say it loudly and proudly that Black lives do matter. Doctors estimate that Jonah will be about 6'5", so at what point will he become a threat just in his body, just in the space? And so we will stand in protest of all police brutality and all brutality against African Americans, male and female. Mohammed. I'm 25 years old, born in Brooklyn, and I'm an illustrator. A lot of my artwork is about intimacy. So if, even if it's something simple like this guy over here, um, this is like, like a real scene that's from like my real life, but not me always. I always try to have like um, stand-ins for stories, like my own stories or stories that I know. Just seeing these images kind of reminds me of the world that I want to see. Um, the world that I do see, right, sisterhood and stuff and things that I, um, I feel a part of. I'm part of a bigger picture 
we can't always be stuck on what we're up against. I think we need to also look at what does the future look like for us and for future generations. So my family is Muslim. We are Muslim Indians, which is always like a little strange for people to hear, but it's actually very common. Islam has played a huge role in my life, um, especially because it's so cultural. It's not just a religion that like, that doesn't, it dictates so much of our life, of our culture, of our daily routine. My earliest memory of like knowing that I was gay goes back to like the eighth grade, I think. I think I had a crush on like my math teacher. That's around puberty, so like around 12, 13. I knew that it was wrong. It felt, I knew that it felt wrong, but it also like made a lot of sense to me. I think uh, confronting that kind of like self-hatred of like wanting to smother this thing came with just like teenage rebellion, like 16, 17, realizing that like there's this huge world out there that, I, that I'm gonna like thrive in. And that might mean losing something as strong as institutional as my faith. That's been there since day one, um, that has carried me through everything. Knowing that like, if I have to lose that for me to kind of feel free, that's what that's gonna take. It's always been as part of my identity, but I stopped practicing for a few years because there was no uh, reconciliation between the two for me. It was like, you're either gay or you're either Muslim and there's no such thing as a gay Muslim. Also the thought of like, it's not just like, oh, I'm leaving my religion. It's like, I'm leaving my religion to possibly one day burn in hell for this. What is it, biryani? Uh, yes. You made it on Sunday? Uh, yes. Oh. You were busy. I made that. Who came over? Oh, Aini and Isan and his parents. And his parents? Oh, and Mariam? Yes, Mariam was here. My parents and I have had some difficult, very brief conversations about being gay. Um, always very, very short and Pretty much essentially like if you plan on being gay, you don't belong here or like you can't stay in this house. Um, and being young, unemployed in college and stuff, I was never in a place to take them up on that, on that, on that like bait. I've just never wanted to spell it out for them in a way that would hurt them. Um, and so I've always, so like, I always call it like a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing where we don't and like, like I hate where that comes from, but it's, I think it's a pretty accurate, like my parents and I are gonna like respect ourselves in our space and not um, confront this like really, pretty large integral conversation that we should be having, but I know that like, as immigrants, as Muslims, they're not really there yet. What's the one, it's like goat and, put, like, oh, put a nihari. bones, nihari, yeah. Oh, yeah, nihari. yeah, yeah, nihari is good. Yeah. Um, with the, it's messy, but I like it. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> and Papa too likes yeah, nihari he a lot. Likes. With the, with the that's Hyderabadi or that's? Uh, yeah, all, yeah, Hyderabadi mostly, yeah. And Sutria is always really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because I know it's all about love. I know that like all they do is love me and it's like, and they want the best for me. And so for Muslim immigrants who are coming to this country that's so different, like literally the opposite of a lot of their ideals back home, I had to learn to honor that and respect that. And to know that like the West is not this great liberal, like genius thing. There, like there's actually a lot of truth and beauty in what they want, what, what my parents came up in. End of the day, like they don't want me to go to hell and burn. How long since you've seen these? Oh, a very long time. Cute. Aww. When is that, 2000? Uh, 2000, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were 10 years old. Oh, when I was coming to America, first time. First time? Yes. This Shada is leaving Bhaji, India? Yes, Shada, last day oh. of in India, you know, Shada Bhaji, Fazana Bhaji. Oh, and still your best friends, you still have yeah, to call them? Yeah, I always talk to These them. are real glasses? Prescription? Yeah. Anybody? Yes. <laughs> my friends come over all the time. For a long time they didn't. I was always so scared, like, oh, my mom's gonna see that these guys are gay or these guys are queer. Like, what is that gonna, what is that gonna look like? Um, or I'm not ready to have that conversation. But now my friends come over all the time. Um, I, I've had, like, partners over. Um, my parents have met, like, uh, like an ex-boyfriend before. And, like, but it's always very, like, uh, the context is always kind of switched around, but they, I mean, they're, they're, they're smart. They know what's going on. I mean, everyone always say moms know, and I think that's really true. Like my mom knows, and who knows if she was actually like really down for the convo, and I just never had it with her. So I just wanted to show you smart. You're always wondering, what am I doing in my room? But this is usually what I'm working on. Oh. And you know. I look like you. Oh. <laughs> and you know, different bodies, different hairstyles, mm -hmm. everything. And you know, all my friends are so different. Mm -hmm. and. 
and sometimes like desi clothes too. Oh, okay. So, but you know, like I'll like a like a sweater, but then a gurta underneath. Mm -hmm. Good. So like oh, in a kurta. Oh, it's like it's like um some some kind of mahar maharani. Yeah. Yeah. But then also like with the baseball cap. Oh, okay. So like modern, but also from oh, like, okay. like uh, our oh, okay. culture too. So mm -hmm. it's kind of nice. Oh, I like the design, uh, the the kurta you made. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 especially up here, right? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. This I got from. You have something like this. Yes. Yes. And I just went to your room. I looked yeah. at it, and then I mm -hmm. and then I did it. And like yeah, the ring. Yeah, you're doing good job. Thank you. I wish I could openly show them like a piece I made after a really bad breakup, but then like just the layers there, it's too deep to kind of like figure out. And um, I do want to show them more of the stuff that's not as like heavy or layered. Um, I just think it's a little, it's hard for me to, I mean like that work is just as, is, it's hard to like show that and not show the others. That feels a little like I'm hiding and I don't really want to, I'm not interested in doing that. Coming back into faith has come through kind of a funny way. Um, I found myself reciting a prayer that I grew up reading um, in any time of need. So like a fear or safety, um, like in a car ride, airplane ride, anything like that. And so kind of know that like my first crutch in these times of need were Islam and like this, this like prayer in Arabic that I grew up uh, reading every day. Um, it really made me question like what the bridge was between my spirituality and what I was calling myself being a very spiritual person and my identity as a Muslim. Um, that's when it kind of came full circle and I realized like, oh, like you're, those two things, your concept of the universe and your concept of Allah are like one and the same. Um, and you don't have to fight that. Music, I call it Mozart. Uh, and if you the target, then I'ma throw darts. It's just me and I'm rolling just like a go kart. See me going ham, I'm spitting. No, got no minutes on point in my show. Got a fuzz, been a tenant. Keep on thinking that you fly. Have you hanging like a banner? I thought I could have do it, but my pops told me to man up. I'm supposed to hear myself, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't hear myself. I only heard it like once the beat started. Yo, yo, check, 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 check. Yo, play the beat? Yeah, check, check, check. Alright. You ready? Yeah. You see how I switch up the flow. You be playing against, but this life ain't a joke. I do this all alone. Like, what's happening? And you stacking and you know that they be hitting because I'm talented. You know how I do it. I'ma leave you here this clueless. I perform for the people when they love my music. It's too late. It's too late. Listen. For some families that live in the courtyard the man the was lying the court. Court. the sight of police no. rushing in is not as scary as most people think how it the sight of a body laying a few feet away to cross the street this evening with their baby in the store when a gun had opened fire and someone decided to pull the trigger. Living in Brownsville, it's, it's a lot of violence, like, it's a lot of violence. There's certain people out here that's doing good for themselves, going to school, going to college. Like, I just recently lost a friend, like, almost two summers ago, and he was just about to go to college. Like, he just graduated from high school, about to leave the college and everything, and he got shot. We don't just come to Brownsville and be like, oh, I'm gonna join the gang because I'm in Brownsville now. This is what we do in Brownsville. Like, no, like, when I first moved to Brownsville, like, I wasn't that type of person. I'm you know, I, I hit up Alonzo, Alonzo's coming. And it was just one day, like, I was with my friends. I was with a couple of my friends at lunch, and then they was just talking to me about this team they were gonna form. They were gonna, like, you know, make moves, make money, uh, defend themselves if anything was to happen. And I was just, I was with it. And don't knock on my door either. Can I get a shirt? This care made me take a bus. You gotta wait. Unfortunately. Pull up, bro. 
we all keeping out of trouble one day, and then the next day we decide we just wanna go do something reckless. That's mm -hmm. up to us, the program can't stop that. It's just about, they give you the skills and the lessons you need. It's up to you to take it in and go do what you, go do right with it. Where? They like Trey, they put him in a good, he wanna do music, he, he got put in a good music situation now. He doing a lot with Sons of Browns for that, because he taking the skills and he learning something different, learning and doing something different with it every time. Oh, wait, start it over time, start it over. I'm sorry. All right. My whole life I was a shit but a misfit. Another statistic, though, to myself, I probably drop out and do this shit, record it, smoking and social networking. And you, oh, uh, damn, that was way off beat. That was way off beat. Was, that was good, though? Yeah. All right. Being an African-American team, a black team, especially being that I'm a male, I get into a lot of trouble and a lot of situations. I'm, you not, you not. I'm Last year, 2015, I was arrested three times. The cops, if they're nice enough, they'll buy you food. Like, it was this one cop, she bought me McDonald's. And the same cop that bought me McDonald's, she also knew my little brother. Like, she used to buy my little brother comic books and, and coloring books and stuff, so I was good. My cousin was in there too with me the third time I got locked up. I seen like three dudes jump this one dude and he ended up having to get staples in his head. He had to get like all types of pills. It was it wasn't really nothing. Like it was just when I seen those fights, it was like, oh snap, like this is real. Like I didn't know this happened. Like I thought we just sitting there and wait. We get locked up, we get put in a situation, don't just throw the book at niggas they first try. Feel me? You best up there like from the internet. My first charge, I couldn't get a job for a minute. I had to start doing community justice and the work to get myself in a position to go out, get a job. Like, in a way, even how it happened, still starting off with them, people still look at me like I was in a criminal because I was in a community justice center program. And they look at it as, oh, those is reformed criminals. But really, when it's really not, it's like, we trying to do good, but y'all won't give us the opportunity to. Being here, you around all this violence, like, it's not likely for you to see 21 or 18, let alone, because I have a couple friends, like I said, just died, and it's just sad, like, it's crazy, because, like, you with them one day, and then they go on the next. Five years from now, I do see myself in college, still working on my music, and, um, what else was that, 20 years? 20 years, I see myself married, Hopefully, married, yeah. like one or two kids the most. And more than two, that's too much. Um, in a house, in a big old house with my music settled, feeling like Kanye, listening to myself in the crib. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. Just gotta live life? Man, take it one day at a time. Ain't nobody trying to waste it, cause I ain't even got no patience, sheesh. Man, what was me and for my dreams for the futuristic old to me? Cut. Cut. always a struggle and um, you know how to be yourself without all this um, discrimination that um, you know that we faced on a daily basis. Today is trying to bring people back. Where are we? What's our community like? I was always uh, curious about what was happening on the outside of my community and I wasn't allowed and uh, when I found New York I was just elated to find something different from where I came from.
I came out as a three-piece butch. I wore the suits and I padded things down and I was very much um, so-called butch. And, um, but that whole look brought negative attention to me. So men would want to stop and, and cause a, a fight. And, uh, and if I was with my lover, the first thing they would pick is, hey, sister, you know, what you need is a good male, stiff, and you need this, and, you know, and I would get so harassed on the street. Salsa Soul uh, was, de was developed because of women's lack of services, uh, discrimination, um, health, lack of health care, that we just needed to be with each other, uh, to network, to sit down and talk about some of the problems that we ran into. I marched out of my shoes. We were building a movement. Circle of Voices became something for women to be proud of. That was, women really worked hard. I got a lot of um, cooperation from women once I, they realized that I was serious. The next big issue is where, where are we going? sitting down and talking and deciding where we want to go and, and um, uh, that's one of the main ones, getting the youth and the elders together and talk about where we have been, what it was like for us and our, our music, our culture, our, our past and help bring that forward. blink moment in time. People are aware of what they're feeling every day. If you're going to restore and sustain a democracy, there must be an informed and engaged citizen. I spent two years in immigration detention. You know how much they spent to feed me for one whole day? How much? 75 cents. Immigrants as a whole, migration as a whole, is associated with lower rates of crime. Immigrants make our communities safer. What causes climate change, the selling and burning of fossil fuels, benefits most the power elite. And so they have a disincentive to address it, and they have an incentive to deny it. They're not going to funnel more money into our schools. They're not going to do it unless they have to. 
right? And the way they have to is by our participation, our organization, us taking accountability for our actions. Jimmy 之后会带上我自制的独弦琴到地铁音乐委员会给我安排的时间和地点去演奏。二零零五年的二月份，我由中国深圳移民来到纽约，带上五千美元。首先学习赌场发牌员。交了学费三千美元总共 15家应聘清洁工 你这一次来美国就当成旅游吧，就这样回中国大陆吗？我我很不甘心。就跟我哥哥说，我想留下来，但是我哥哥说那你有什么特长？我就说我有，我可以吹笛子。我哥就说开始呢因为当时中国大陆的各种经济
，因为你要一站，一吹了五六个钟头，我想要必须另外找个乐器。那二胡呢，在地铁里面有几十把二胡在拉，我肯定是不行。拉小提琴也不行，小提琴是老外的他们的本门绝活，我就说那我就学独弦琴吧。因为独弦琴毕竟是在纽约这没有见很特殊一种乐器。练了六年独弦琴，二零一五年我就拿独弦琴去考这个 audition， 结果呢一考就中。当时那个金爷说：“哎呀，他说东方的音乐给给我们这个这个 audition 带来一股春风，获得了地铁音乐委员会颁发的演奏职业执照。我顿时有一种由游击队转为正规军的感觉，从此不再担心。”警察的罚款。我演奏的独弦琴是中国特有的、古老的、特别的乐器，因为它有独特的、柔美的声音和特有的演奏技巧。加之我自己加进了我独创的华子音、琶音，更加赋予了独弦琴的。更丰富的表现力，又只有一根弦，因此常常吸引了众多的中外听众的眼球。每当我看到一个个老外聆听我的琴声，一个个相机的牌照，一一声声的打听这个乐器的历史，我就自豪而高兴。Has an extraordinary maritime story, which has been largely forgotten or lost, or certainly not celebrated、um, in our institutions of culture、um, in this city. Red Hook had been a peninsula, a marshy place. The creation of Atlantic Dock turned Red Hook into a maritime center, which became nationally important and, in some ways, internationally important. And that history was largely forgotten. So we're not just about Red Hook at Portside. We love Red Hook. We have a hyper-local relationship to it. But Red Hook's story is New York City's maritime story in microcosm. We're sitting in a wheelhouse.、Uh, I've got my hand on a wheel that was held for 20 years by my father-in-law. He was the captain from the day she was rechristened Mary Whalen. In many ways, she's a symbol for the waterways, and Portside's mission is the waterways. All of Portside's programs—they're diverse as to type, but they're all related, connected by this theme of water, waterfront, and maritime. Some of those are preservation, like preserving the ship. Some of them are job training programs. The ship is a training site for District Council Line, the painters, the Union for the Painters and Allied Trades. We have、uh, summer vocational or CTE internships with high school students from. With Sad Williamsburg High School of Architecture and Design, school trips come here. We've used the boat for educational programs from grades、uh, first through college professors. We all love the Mary Whalen, and I have to say I've been really impressed and surprised, honestly,、um, the reception that she had because she was not envisioned from the outset as being the central focus. When this ship was 
uh, launched in 1938 originally. This was a class of ship and a, a class of a way to control a ship, and they were called bell boats, and there were many of them at the time. We are the last in the United States. This is all original from 1938. Speaking tube is here. That was basically to get the engineer's attention, make sure he was hearing that you needed to send him a message. The message was communicated via those pulls down there, bell and jingle. There is a code, how many bells, how many jingles, that indicates to the engineer whether you wanted to go forward, astern, and the speed. Right, so this here is the telegraph, which you may recognize for some old, old movies. Um, in a bell boat, the instructions about how to control the telegraph are communicated by bells. And so you can read actually one, two, three, four. So this is the speed, the velocity controlled by the engineer. And this here is the direction of the engine. So a stern means back. There you go, back. Stern. And then ahead. Now this is a direct reversing engine, which also means you have to, if you're changing directions, you have to completely stop the engine. That becomes significant if you're operating in tight quarters. For example, the Gowanus Canal, um, the Mary Whalen delivered fuel to Bayside Fuel to both terminals in the Gowanus Canal and up in Newtown Creek. And in those tight places, you, know, you have to go forward, back, turning around. Imagine what it is when you park a car. The car responds instantly, stop, start, you, put, you shift gears. Here, communicating to the engineer via bells and jingles requires being thinking ahead like five moves and that's what the captain had to do to park this boat. One of the things that's very special to me about the Portside Project is the kind of people that it's attracted um, and what it's meant to them and it's very diverse. People come and they learn something new, they recenter themselves, they find something um, and I think that's the, the power of the project. It's also the power of the waterfront. There's something special and contemplative um, that happens around the water, and sailors know that, and they work very hard, but that's also part of the experience, and so we're part of a lot of that here. This ship sits on the water. She lived on the water. She worked on the water. And uh, our efforts are to restore the waterways in New York, after all, it's the reason for the city being here, is our water. Not our waterfront, but our waterways. Symbolically, the ship as an office for Portside, New York, is an advocate as we are advocates for that work. Oh, did Chicklet make an appearance? Good, good. Oh, good, she's in position, Chicklet. For us to really deliver the goods that we're after, we want to have a boat building shop for youth and adults. We want to have classroom space to be teaching people boating safety sorts of things. And so that we can have year-round space for conferences and exhibits and talks, which the Mary, as wonderful as she is, doesn't really hold. So we're in negotiations right now um, to get space adjoining the ship in the warehouse, which would be transformative, a real game changer. You're welcome to come aboard the Mary Whalen for Tanker Time. Tanker Time is every weekday, Monday to Friday, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then the second Sundays of the month, it's at night. So it's 5 p.m. to midnight. During Tanker Time, the main deck is open and it's set with furniture and you can come have a meeting, um, your lunch, a book, uh, whatever. The interior is only open for scheduled Tanker Tours because we have our offices here, we're doing restoration work, so we have to limit the interior access. We so look forward to having office space off the boat and then we'll be able to open up the interior more often. The evening Tanker Time, there's even more furniture out on the deck and people typically bring dinner, a bottle of wine, their main squeeze. Earlier on, it's parents with young kids, and then the music starts, and it gets darker, and it goes on until midnight. And it's a fabulous way to end the weekend. It's important to lift up our sisters who are no longer here, and brothers who are no longer here as well, and for those who are in, who, who are in, so do you think people care for real? Yes, they do care. We are here. 
we are showing them that we care about them. If nobody else in the world care about them, we do. The course is during Pride. And there's a lot of visibility and heightened attention. But what do you think needs to happen tomorrow to make real, real change moving forward? Um, we need to focus on our housing. We need to focus on our education of trans people to uplift our community, things of that nature that will help and send us on the right track, enlighten us, um, help us to build our own communities, uh, you know, and yeah. be able to stand on our own two feet. Why do you think folks are having such a rough time? Why can't people just get over it? Because, because, pe because people are afraid of what they don't understand. But what they need to understand is that we are human beings as well, and we need and we have the right to have housing as well as everybody else. We need a chance to prove who we are, because if we are vibrant, a vibrant, colorful, lively passionate, loving people. We're human beings. Once more, we're Americans. We deserve it. Do you think that something like this is kind of like the new civil rights movement? Yes, it's, it's very in sync with the civil rights movement because right now, um, in this time in transgender lives and, you know, with the behaviors, with the wanting, with the lust for life that we have for equality, it's imperative that we have equal rights. And it's just, it don't just start here. It's all around the world, you know, and we just trying to start it from here, from this. Let's ignite it from here and let's spread the word around the world. We are in the civil rights and what we're trying to do is do it peacefully. We don't want violence. What we want is equality. Is that too much hard to ask for? How do you feel about this? I mean, is it emotional? Yeah, it is. It's wonderful. There aren't a lot of trans people who have supportive parents, so to have um, to have one is is a blessing um, and something I don't take for granted. <laughs> need to stop being racist. They need to own up to racism. They need to own up to the fact that by putting ourselves in binary boxes with equality, with, with gender, and in binary boxes with race, and not acknowledging that we all need to figure this out together, figure out the intersectionality, and every moment of our lives choose to be queer, choose to queer our assumptions, then uh, then we can find it together. Um, it's important because um, if we forget, we'll keep uh, laying down to the same oppression that keeps getting brought to us and will you know this reminds us to resist in the present moment so if we remember everything that we've been through in the past along the way and that other people have gone through in the past and you know particularly that TGNC people of color really led the resistance movement from the beginning the folks don't know that. yeah a lot of folks don't know that um, so if we don't keep lifting that up you know white supremacy is going to keep making us all forget My name is Lean Schumann, um, I'm a BCS senior, and my short film, Cut in Half, it was originally a writing assignment in school. My English teachers told me that we were um, going to submit papers for a contest for scenarios. And then, it, like we started, like learning about them, learning what they did, like the short, like other short films that um they created. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's cool. Scenarios USA uses the power of storytelling through, through the art of filmmaking and writing to empower young people to tell their stories and to find agency in their voices. 
the main thing of what we do and the most important part of what we do, it begins in the classroom. So we, we create a curriculum that asks questions that challenges students and allows educators to create a safe environment for students to talk about difficult issues such as um, love, solidarity, gender, race, power. These students, they are given the option to submit their stories to our writing contest. We call it the Real Deal Writing Contest. We get about three to four hundred submissions every time we have our competition and that's when we bring in the top two and then we announce the winners and pair them with the directors. I knew that I wanted to write about love and solidarity but I wanted something